Hi everyone, I'm George Farrar, and welcome to Jax 86, Jacksonville as it was in the year 1986. Here we see the Jacksonville, downtown Jacksonville Riverfront, we see the St. Johns River, we see the newly constructed Riverwalk, dedicated in 1985. We see the City Hall at the time, directly across, towards the right. And back then, of course, it was a different time. Sun Bank, South East Bank, those banks aren't around anymore. Now Prudential's around, but look, we have the, what was the original Prudential building, Later on, it became the Aetna and the One Call building. And then what I would always kind of know as the new Prudential building that had been recently constructed uh, earlier on uh, in the 1980s. And we see the Chart House. Unfortunately, I never had the opportunity to check out uh, the Chart House restaurant. But I'm sure uh, if you went there, it probably was a fun time. So a lot of new development, new construction, a lot of focus on the riverfront for people to come downtown, to go downtown and enjoy what the river had to offer. And here we see Crawl Daddies. Back in 86, the Main Street Bridge, otherwise known as the John T. Alsop Jr. Bridge, was having a paint job it looks like. And just beyond it, you can see that the Jacksonville Landing is under construction. Just beyond that, you can see uh, the Civic Auditorium, later to be known as the Times Union Center for the Performing Arts. Just beyond that, the Brownish Building there, that is the Federal Building. Uh, the Florida National Bank Building is directly ahead. And then to the right, of course, the Southern Bell Building. So. Here we have the first ironwork starting to go up on the Jacksonville Landing earlier in the year. And you can see just beyond it, the Independent Life Building was known as the Independent Life Building, currently known as the Wells Fargo Center. And it's neat because you can see just beyond that uh, one of the unique buildings uh, on Laura Street. Okay, so we see this big development that's going to bring people downtown to shop, to dine, to be entertained, maybe to have a couple drinks, to party, to be festive, to enjoy what the St. John's River and the surrounding downtown area has to offer. And so this is a big, huge commitment that the city of Jacksonville and has made to put really, you could almost basically say a showplace on the river and to give people the kind of more familiar experience, uh, especially people uh, like I could say even uh, myself and people around me at the time, something more relatable uh, that People, where people enjoyed like the mall experience, having that kind of experience downtown. So there was a lot of work that was put in in the year 1986 to get the landing constructed. And though we look back here in this picture from 1982, this should be a familiar picture to you for those of you who've been watching this year by year series of Jacksonville history. This is what the old Jacksonville Terminal, Union Terminal, sometimes called Union Station, uh, this is what it looked like in 1982. And there was a man named Prime Osborne III, and he led a railroad company, CSX. And in 1982, he joined with a lot of people in a public-private partnership to get a convention center constructed at the old Jacksonville Terminal. So there was new structure that was completed that we know of today and a renovation of the old Jacksonville Railroad Station. Built, opened in 1919, renovated and reopened as a convention center 
on October 17, 1986. Prime F. Osborne III. The convention center was named after him. And so, what do you do when you have a newly opened convention center? Well, in 1986, in Jacksonville, you have Ramses II. A big exhibit about Ramses II, otherwise known as Ramses the Great, a pharaoh of ancient Egypt. From long ago, he led the ancient Egyptians. And so I was going to have the opportunity to visit this exhibit twice. One time on a school field trip, and we know what school field trips are like. Line up here, line up there, line up here, line up there. Don't go there, don't go here. Keep moving, keep moving. And then, since it was one of the biggest things going on in the city that year, I also visited with my father and my stepmother. And in that experience, uh, I had a lot more time to enjoy the artifacts from that time. Here is an illustration of, from the imagination of someone of what Ramses the Great, Ramses II, would have looked like. So I had more of a chance in the evening to see some of the artifacts I found to be more interesting again. And it was a real fun experience. And then I started reading a lot about the Valley of the Kings and about uh, ancient Egyptian history. And I started reading a lot more about history. And I'll tell you later on in the show a little bit more about what was really getting things going on. Uh, 1986 was a real fun year. I'd have to say it was one of the funnest years uh, of my life in a lot of ways. Uh, my mind opened to a lot of, um, to a lot of things. Uh, I began to, to really discover some uh, opportunities for creativity. What was so hilarious was that in 1986, around that time, a song came out from the all-female group, The Bangles, Walk Like an Egyptian. So the song, along with a lot of the real upbeat, positive music of the time, really, uh, really inspired me. I really, really had a good time. I can remember a lot of fun days in 1986. Uh, but there was a lot ahead. And so here we see Mayor Jake Godbold in what was the city hall at the time, uh, which has since been demolished. You saw the, uh, towards the beginning of the show, you saw the city hall of it back then. And so here he is in a, uh, looks like a news conference, press conference, maybe an announcement. Uh, so he has a lot going on uh, in the 1980s. And so in 1986, with the new convention center opening, with the, the next year, the landing to be completed. The automated Skyway Express was in the planning stages and was on its way to being constructed. So, so much going on. I have to say, throughout this year-by-year -year series, throughout this series, he was definitely the most productive mayor, and I would say that he was the most productive mayor in our city's modern history. Here, he's at the ribbon cutting of the Jacksonville branch of the Mayo Clinic. This was a big thing, a big accomplishment, a big step forward for the city. Jobs, a big health care uh, clinic. Uh, there were also going to be, and as I recall, with, uh, with St. Luke's, uh, particularly um, different hospitals, were really growing uh, throughout the city in the 1980s. I believe Memorial was. Uh, a lot of the different uh, hospitals, health clinics, uh, there were a lot more, um, you could see a lot more clinics being constructed, basic, um, uh, basic care uh, clinics as well. So this was something that we can look back at as another accomplishment. And here we see the building uh, under, looks like just finishing construction. 
So, a lot going on in 1986, but there was definitely, though, certainly some concerns that were expressed out there on, uh, in the editorial cartoons of Ed Gamble. Uh, now, there's the talk of, here we see the old, J what's considered kind of JTA and, and that, that a lot of the equipment and everything is dilapidated, run down. Uh, this was before JTA actually had a bus station. A lot of times back then, the buses were around Hemming Park, and so you see the people sitting at the bench. But things were going to eventually improve, but there were a lot of concerns. In this case here, we see the incredible and amazing city council. And this guy says, don't worry, I know what I'm doing, and trying to, to cut through and, and without, without uh, getting the guy. So, um, it, so I think one thing that we'll, do, we'll be doing uh, in JAX 87 in our next show is to take a look at some of the challenges that the city was facing. Uh, these were urgent challenges, and these were challenges I was starting to see on the street, and we'll discuss that later. Now here we have five reasons why the school bond proposal failed. Now I'm not going to go into all the specifics on it. Herb Sang, references didn't like Herb Sang. Herb Sang was the school superintendent uh, at the time. Uh, and people say, hey, we're fed up with taxes, right? Well, the problem was, and I was deep in the middle of it at Crown Point Elementary School, was that kids were being crammed in like sardines. Now when I started at Crown Point in the third grade, they had an art room, a music room. The, the third grade was an incredibly enriching time because it was the only time <laughs> for a while um, before I would actually, ex again, before I would actually experience, if anything, a music room or an art room. Uh, by the fourth grade, those had become classrooms. More kids, you know, some, in the old song, um, more money, more problems, but more kids, more problems. I, I think that there were some stresses, certainly some concerns I had as a kid. They were trying to expand um, the school system to accommodate the growth that was happening where I was living in Mandarin. And so the bond issue was supposed to be able to fund these uh, uh, new school buildings, expansions, improvements. But there were, it was pitted essentially as people in the suburbs and the more, that were more affluent and middle class versus the people in the inner cities, poor, so it, that, I don't believe it worked out. Later on, they would construct an addition onto Crown Point Elementary, but I wouldn't be able to enjoy it. I would only see the construction of it. Uh, my half-brother John later on would experience it and enjoy the expanded school, essentially. But what you see here is a modern picture of Crown Point Elementary. By the fifth grade at Crown Point Elementary, I really wanted out. There were things going on I didn't like. There was overcrowding. The uh, math class at one point, at one point my math class was actually in the computer room, but there, were no, there was no chalkboard and you just did your math problems in a notebook and you had your math book and you had the teacher and that was it. Uh, later on I'd have very visual math teachers. I would learn math really well and my math was going to improve. But in January of 86, Crown Point Elementary I uh, sent home a letter saying they were concerned about my math performance. I barely passed the fifth grade by the skin of my teeth. Um, I, I will look forward as we begin to transition away from talking about Crown Point Elementary. Uh, I think everyone in the situation that was there, uh, that were there, did the best that they could. And I coped with it simply by reading. Now, uh, at one point on a day in January 1986, a very cold day in January of 1986, I was actually doing my math in my fifth grade classroom with, uh, it was the fifth grade class, Miss Dewey's class, right? January 28th, 1986, I'm bored, I'm doing my math. Miss Dewey comes in and says something has happened to the space shuttle. And I knew a little bit more about the space shuttle than I otherwise would have known uh, because in December of 1985, right around there, maybe it was November of 1985, 
the latter part of 1985, I had gone on a field trip down to the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral. So as I was in Crown Point Elementary on that very cold, frigid day in 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger was lifting off from its launch pad, but it would not make it into space. The Space Shuttle came apart and the Challenger 7, the crew, were killed. So this was a big national tragedy and I'll always remember it. So that day at Crown Point, uh, Miss Dewey asked us to form a line and we went down to the computer room and we, um, a lot, I believe not just our class but other classes, uh, walked in the computer room all the monitors had, the, and it stunned me because oh, you can actually put TV in on these, <laughs> on these these computers, and they they had wired the TV, uh, a TV station, uh, and I saw Peter Jennings, and he talked about what was happening, uh, and I learned that it was a teacher in space, or with part of the teacher in space program, uh, Krista McAuliffe, uh, died among the crew so this was a big thing and you would you can only imagine my shock because I had not that long ago been there and I was intrigued by the space program I was intrigued by science studying the solar system in the fifth grade so it was a remarkable tragedy and it was something that that uh, and, and you would see you would see the images over and over again. These were professional people. Uh, it took a lot to get through the teacher in space um, program for Ms. McAuliffe to reach that that zenith, that point. And I could have seen a future if this hadn't happened of maybe more of a regularization of career specialties, people going up. And we don't know where the future would have gone. Now, later that day, I went home and I was in the living room in our ranch house in Mandarin on Dimsdale. And President Ronald Reagan came on television and I watched the speech. Uh, now, I would later not always agree with the, Ronald Reagan's po politics, policies. Um, but he had some very unique qualities and a love for the nation that projected over television really well. And he was a, for a kid, he was a great president to have in that sense because he could console our nation in a very tough time because we lost not only the Challenger 7, but we lost, I think, a trajectory uh, of our space program. And on that evening, in one of the greatest speeches I believe that he ever gave, he said, the crew of the Space Shuttle Challenger honored us by the manner in which they lived their lives. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. It was a tragedy that was early in the year, um, but by the summer of 86, a lot was happening. Now, I was going to be going to RV Daniels. I was going to be bused downtown. I was going to go from being in a school in the suburbs in Mandarin, Crown Point, to being farther away from my parents, farther away from my neighborhood that I knew. But I was going to get this new start. Now here we see a modern picture of R.V. Daniels. And the only thing I can recognize from this picture at all are just the little windows, uh, which was the, kind of the architectural distinction of it. You didn't have a lot of windows. It was more of an enclosed type school, an older school. It was a school, looked, I believe it was built in the 1960s. Um, but don't quote me on that. 
But that doesn't matter in the sense of there was a lot of concern because it was downtown. They held, they held a, um, a program uh, for the parents and students talking about the school. And I, they had a band. And, it, and I went, oh man, they got a band. And it stunned me. And the band was so great that, that they, 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 did, they did these interesting numbers. They did In the Air Tonight, which was a popular song. In the Air Tonight by Phil Collins. And then when the drummer did the drum, da -da 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 -da, the drummer, and it ricocheted around the cafeteria and you could hear the music. It was stunning and it was amazing. So I decided then and there, I wanted to get into the RV Daniels band. So that was a big thing. But then, you know, the summer comes and a great summer movie comes along. And I got a chance in the movie theater with my family to see what I consider to be the greatest family movie uh, that I ever saw. And it happens that he played a clarinet at one point. I went, whoa, okay. Guess what, folks? Um, I'll be talking a little bit here and there about playing the clarinet in various bands throughout the city of Jacksonville, um, school bands. And it's going to be an interesting little story about how that progresses. And we'll talk a little bit uh, more on that uh, later on. Um, but it was interesting because the RV Daniels band um, had the... Um, they had the, we would um, practice on the stage uh, in the cafetorium, basically. So that was neat. But yeah, the, Ferris Bueller's Day Off was a cool movie, and it really was of the 1980s. And it really kind of was interesting because he goes into downtown Chicago with his friends for some misadventures and some fun. Okay, so while I'm visiting a lot of movie theaters, my dad... I was fortunate to have a father who liked us to go first weekend, maybe second weekend, on the biggest movies ever made. Uh, we were starting to say goodbye to the drive-in movie theaters that I would only experience a couple times. I, I may have probably, in the course of my life, only visited five drive-in theaters. One of them was the Midway on Beach Boulevard, near Southside Boulevard. And this is how I remember Midway. And you see the, see the sign on the back? It would light up at night. And you went in. You paid, your, you paid for your, you know, paid to get your ticket. You went in. Um, some, of the, some of the older ones had the speakers. So you could hear that would be sitting right next to your window. Uh, others, um, later on, I think all of them really, when I was around, uh, had, had the radio stations where you could tune into a radio station and you were getting the sound in your car. So uh, I'll have more, more to say later on uh, on the channel about Jacksonville's amazing old drive-in theaters. It was, again, another unique family experience and another memory. Memories of the Midway and the old drive-in on University and Phillips. Um, Th those memories, those are some deep ones. Everything you see here would eventually be demolished and replaced by a Walmart. Again, this is on Beach Boulevard near Southside Boulevard. Back then, I think things were more relaxed, laid back. I think people were less uptight. Dare I say it? Uh, and... If you were not really up to being uptight, or if you were very uptight, you might have wanted to avoid Eddie Murphy. <laughs> For mature audiences, Eddie Murphy at Jack's, the old Jacksonville Coliseum, uh, Friday, August 22nd, 1986 at 8 p.m. $15.50 apparently. Okay, so now this is a early 1980s picture of me riding a horse, and I've wanted to talk about what made where I lived in the suburb generally known as Mandarin, okay, not not in old Mandarin, but in the suburb generally would be referred to as Mandarin off of Dimsdale Road. Uh, Tim Lute had a couple stores. Uh, he had a, around this time, he had a feed store 
in Mandarin called Mandarin Feed. It was where the Bank of America is right now on Old St. Augustine Road and Hartley. Uh, there would have been a will champ right just across Hartley. This feed store was, an, was a kind of a ramshackle old barn type thing. I think it may have, from what I've seen on a Facebook group page, it may have at one point been known as the Hayloft. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I had a chance to develop some work ethic and some great appreciation for the people uh, of that time in Mandarin. I, if you ever showed up at Mandarin Feed in the mid-80s and a guy, a kid, and I mean a kid, with glasses came stumbling towards you with a big bale of hay and crammed it into your Ford, your your truck, your uh, <laughs> or whatever, um, that that was me. So I had the opportunity to work uh, at the at the at the feed store just as a kid, just you know for you know soda whatever. There's nothing really, nothing really formal or major or anything about it. Just good old working in kind of general with the family business, so to speak, briefly, in that in that that mode. But uh, he would later on do a store in Bayard, and I'll tell you more about that. So here we're looking at a modern picture. This is a modern picture. There used to be a Winn-Dixie here. Now, if this looks familiar to you, then we're talking Old St. Augustine Road and San Jose. Okay, the Kmart would be directly across to the right if you were to look past and go look across um, uh, San Jose. If you look straight out to the left, you'll see the the shopping center with the kind of the archways. I remember when that was under construction. I remember when that wasn't even there. This was a Winn Dixie, and they had on this building straight ahead at us. They had a sign that said, Win Dixie, the beef people. They were proud of the meat department. Now, as a kid, uh, I was not a fan of going along with my family to grocery shop. I still, to this day, am not a big fan of grocery shopping. Uh, but this brings back memories. Also, there was a Sears Surplus store in that same shopping comp complex and, and I wasn't a big fan of that either. <laughs> I like the real Sears at the, at the Orange Park Mall. Okay, so this is a Ford Tempo GL, not the actual car which I would ride in, but uh, this is what it looked like. And it was, to me, it was a car of the 80s. And my father uh, decided it was time to get rid of, I could called it the Ford Fairmont uh, in our last show. It really is a Mercury Zephyr is what we had. A blue, white blue, Mercury Zephyr, he decided to get a Ford Tempo GL, a black Ford Tempo GL, and I loved it. It made, that car made so much fun uh, for me uh, for a while, uh, being able to ride around in it. Um, we all, I think, enjoyed the Tempo GL. Now, as we take one last look at the 1986 construction of the Jacksonville Landing, which would eventually become an epic retail, dining, entertainment place on the riverfront. I want to speak to you from October 26, 2019, speaking in contemporary times. Earlier in 2019, businesses closed and it was announced that the landing was slated for demolition to be replaced, people say, by a park. Maybe eventually something will come along later uh, to be done. But it's time for me to speak out because I would be remiss as a person who has a deep love for the city I grew up in, who enjoyed what the landing as it was had to offer, I would be remiss if after doing essentially three shows talking about it to not speak up about the Jacksonville landing. It's very important that the people of Jacksonville be engaged with city officials about where the development on the riverfront should go. There has to be leadership for that. Uh, I would hope that as I look from afar, basically, 
uh, that people stand up and try to do what's right to make our city special. Because there's something that was unique that the landing represented. There was something that was unique in what was offered. While it declined over the years, and I experienced that decline, and it was a painful decline to witness. There will be even a bigger decline if the people of Jacksonville don't stand up, speak out, and do what's right in an effort to take back the city's destiny. So that's where I stand on it. And I wanted to talk about this with you because in Jax 87, we're going to watch the Jacksonville Landing open its doors. I want to thank you, all of you, who've been watching over the years on the Jax Life channel. The best is yet to come. Stay tuned. Take it easy. See you later.